I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, just a reminder, we should probably wrap it up uh, at about 5.50 to allow a nice transition for our next meeting. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt. All right. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're having a little bit of, or a lot of technical technology problems since we can't get anything displayed there. So when we get to the presentation portion here, we'll ask you to pull that up on your computer. Uh, to follow along. Uh, hopefully we'll have something projected by then, but if not, we'll work from the uh, slides attached to the board docs there. The first item on the work session agenda is FMP 2.0. Last time we were together in a work session, uh, we had introduced uh, kind of revisions to the facility master plan and really wanted to follow up because we kind of ran out of time for additional conversation that evening. Uh, if there was any questions or more information the board would need before we would move ahead uh, with asking for your support of that at a, at a public meeting. Um, like I said, we, we didn't have much time for that. I know I've had some follow-up with some of you individually about what could be some uh, questions or need for additional information. So we just wanted a lot a few minutes at the beginning of this meeting for that, but recognizing that the bulk of what we're here for tonight is uh, to introduce the elementary configuration conversation. So with that, if you have questions or, again, additional information you would want to have uh, before we ask for your support of the revision of that plan, I think that's what we'd like to hear. Director, I emailed my additional ones. So that's all right. Okay. All right. Doesn't sound like it. All right. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. No. So are we going to have a chance to look at the uh, individual board members proposed changes as questions before oh. the next meeting. So you want to see what questions have been raised? Uh, I can give you a few of them. Uh, such as uh, just looking at the, any sort of significant financial contributions we made to either aquatic center, either that one or Mercy Park over time. Uh, I know there's been some community comments about that. Uh, kind of how much was, like, what percentage did we invest in the original Mercer Park pool comparatively to Iowa City, um, you know, Parks and Rec, and also to help, uh, you know, you talked about the gyms at Southeast and City or North Central and Liberty just being full during the wintertime. If we could have some sort of comparison, just pick a weekend and just how booked are those facilities throughout those weekends to kind of get a better idea of the need. Yeah, I think one thing we could easily do, uh, Director Lingo has emailed or sent some of those questions through. We can do our best to respond to those, you know, and put them on board email, and then we could revisit those at the at the board table, and that way everybody could see the questions and the, and the responses. Yeah. Okay. And we'll do our best to pull some of that data. I mean, we've already started working on some of that. Uh, okay. Some of those, I mean, you know, Mercer was built. Like 86? Yeah. And so some of those yeah. those documents might be hard to pull, but we will get what we need to make sure we have it, have it available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I see something projected, but. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just that a magic number. Right. I, I put in the magic number. Thinking That's about the it. last four of our social security. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Write it down. Yep. Yeah. 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 We might be there. Well, I put this number in. It's just our stuff. So I'll just kind of introduce this from the standpoint <laughs> before we get into the kind of the big. Uh, points of the conversation just for more, you know, what we would expect to hear back from you guys or uh, tonight or in the future. Uh, really, uh, tonight, you know, I don't, I don't think we anticipate a lot of feedback uh, from the board, but more an introduction to this conversation uh, and some of the things that we'll probably want to dig into uh, as we travel through this school year and continue to look at um, elementary schools and, and some of the conversation we started uh, last, uh, last spring through the budget reduction process, but also just how we improve, uh, continue to look at improving that elementary uh, student and staff experience uh, here in the district. And so um, that it's a starting point this evening. Uh, we anticipate, like I said, to continue to come back uh, around each of the pieces of this and, and to hear your feedback, the community's feedback, and then continue to adjust and evolve as we go along. And so 
again tonight um, you know not necessarily looking for your opinions or fact statements on any of these things but just more of some information and some level setting for us to get started Good job. Good there we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Eliza>. <laughs> <laughs> Slides, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, I can change slides. I got that down, but they gotta make sure that I saw the purpose. Right so, uh, well, good evening. Um, Eliza and I are going to to walk through this evening's presentation, kind of building off of where um, Matt was. But of course, before I do that, uh, thanks to, to Nick, you know, with doing our HR and our um, a lot of that work. He's had a, a big influence on this, as well as Adam. Adam's not here, but helping us pull that up from across the state. Um, kind of five sections tonight. I'm gonna handle the first two and then hand it over to Eliza, four, three, four, and five. And, and just a note on this slide real quick before we do that. On four, we have exploring academy schools. Um, you may have heard us talk about uh, this is magnet programs. That's a term that we could run this district a long time. And in our conversations as a team, um, you know, we made a decision we want to move away from using that term of magnet. Um, the history of magnet schools is really it grew out of the desegregation uh, days and being somebody from Kansas City. I'm well familiar with uh, what magnet schools were and really what they were intended to do. And as we look at that, um, you know, it was about sending certain students into other certain areas of districts more than it was about the enhanced programming that we could offer. And we're not just trying to move kiddos around, we're trying to provide different opportunities. And so we think looking at them as specific programs or academies, more than that generalized historic term of appointment is where we want to, to be. And so you'll hear us talk about them as academies or specific schools and really get away from that magnet terminology. Um, but as we look first at exploring the 18 section school, um, that's a concept that you've heard Nick talk about during staffing. Uh, the superintendent just mentioned it in his opening remarks. And um, it's not a foreign concept to us here in the district. Uh, if you look at this data on the screen, um, it's from Alexander. Uh, so that is what our sections look like at, at Alexander as we move into to next year and in, in looking at 18 sections, which basically is three sections at each, um, at each grade level. It provides some consistency and then reduces annual changes. We have a number of what we see as the advantages listed up there, but also I point out a couple others specifically. Um, it not only has an impact in terms of what we believe is uh, instructional uh, benefits, it also has operational benefits in terms of standardizing the workload of our custodians, our secretaries, um, and other building supports. So as you look at a focus on effectiveness and efficiency, it grabs that. Um, and we also anticipate a significant reduction in travel for our specialist teachers. Um, this year we don't have, and correct me if I'm wrong, a single specialist teacher that's only in one building, correct me? That's correct. And so all of our special teachers are, 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 are uh, logging some windshield time, as we call, and so we're paying people to drive around the, the district, but more importantly, right, that inhibits those individuals' abilities to feel like they're part of one staff to make those connections with those students and really to provide those supports outside of just what they do instructionally. The 18 section approach will allow us to really maximize our specialist teachers and allow them to be seen as <coughs> key parts of our individual buildings and again, part of that entire educational ecosystem in those, um, in those schools that they serve. And moving that 18 would allow us to do that. So those are some advantages as we see um, and we have schools that are there. Uh, Alexander is uh, an example, as I say, um, but not all of our schools are, are like that. Um, and you can see it captured on this slide. Um, as we look at that, this is what we're currently looking at for next year across all of our elementary schools. So you see there the school name, the total capacity, our pre-K-5 enrollment, uh, the number of sections that equates to um, for each building average class size. Um, we have a wide range. You see that uh, we look at Penn Elementary, we'll have 20 sections next year, all the way down to Shinnick Elementary that will only have six. Not a knock on either one of them, it's just the reality of where we are across our district uh, right now. 
these were pulled in um, July, so it doesn't necessarily account for the new students that we have in August. So again, I think it's just for you all to know, we know that these become public, and so people look at the data, and so that's why we try to make sure that we timestamp it so somebody doesn't come back at us later and be like, that's not what you showed us the enrollment. It's enrollment as of this month that will fluctuate as we as we move it forward. And of course, that means the building averages uh, will increase as, as enrollment increases. So again, as Matt said, uh, we're just trying to share the information to give the baseline of some things that we could look at differently and, and how we um, best utilize our programs and our people across our elementary schools and we see that wide range that we have. Um, and obviously part of this, right, is about how the history of education has changed and the focus that has changed. It, it's probably not surprising that some of our new buildings, if you look at Grant Elementary, for instance, in that 18, it's one of our newer buildings. Uh, Kristen shared with me earlier this week or last week that our oldest elementary school is 100 years old or is almost 100 years old? 1917. 1917. So Longfellow is a Longfellow, right? And man, 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 both of them. Of course, that's why they look the same. They were both the same time. Um, we, we we weren't building schools at that size a hundred years ago, and it's times change and where we built them. Right? These are conversations we've had. And so, part of how big a school is also depended on the era of education in which it was built in. I share that because when you go to this next slide and you look at how we compare to districts across the state, the growth of those districts didn't always track at the same time that the growth of the Iowa City Community School District uh, tracked in terms of when their populations maybe <coughs> or they lost students. And so they were able to build schools at different times that, that we were. But the comparisons still are, are there to show us that we can look at how we compare in terms of enrollment centers um, at the elementary level as, uh, as it compares to some of our um, closest competitors of, uh, across the state to show where maybe um, we could uh, make changes or look at potentially different models to maximize our buildings in a way if we want to continue to move towards that 18 section, um, 18 section concept. A couple of points that are on here just for note. Davenport um, does have a K-6 and a K-8 center. Uh, the average elementary size is based on their K-5 enrollments to match the other UENs, but if you're very familiar with Davenport, um, you might remember that they actually have a K-6 and a K-8 building. And then uh, Cedar Rapids, um, our neighbors to the north, going through some changes. Uh, 20, uh, for this past year, they had 20 schools, and next year, um, they've reduced one, so they'll have 19 elementary schools in the next school year, so uh, similar to where we are in that. But, um, you know, you look at those enrollments and you see some of those numbers um, from Waukee uh, to Cedar Rapids, all within that 3, 000, uh, 6, 3,300 to 6,500 students and a range of elementary schools from 10 to 20. And so um, I think there's lots of different conclusions that can be drawn, but I think one that stands out is that um, it's clearly something that one size does not fit all. And, and so we have to take some of these pieces into consideration, but we also have to be conscious of our community and, and what's driving the needs in our community and what our community is interested in seeing. With that said, though, um, we do see some advantages when we look at how our students come to us and look at this idea of the 18 sections, which is three sections at each grade level. And we've tried our best to depict an example on this slide. Uh, we had a lot of conversation about how to uh, show this. So if you have questions, please ask. But if you have three schools uh, serving uh, 75 students in the second grade, you can see that, um, well, 75 students, if they're serving across three grades, you can see some of the inconsistencies in the class size, right? So you have four classrooms across three different elementaries. If you're able to realign the student population where those 75 second graders all attend one school, you can provide more consistency in the number of students. You then have multiple sections in the same building, so you don't have two buildings where there's only one second grade teacher without anybody in the same grade level to collaborate with, right? Our professional development, as we look at our uh, professional learning communities and our focus on HRS level one, that's an important piece of that, of how we get our adults that, that space to, to learn together. 
And so this is just one example of where if we would look at a situation where keeping our existing buildings but looking at ways to put grade levels so that we have three sections in a building, we can not only maximize our resources, but more importantly, we believe, improve our ability for our teachers to collaborate and some of the consistency and instruction that can be delivered inside some of those schools. With that as kind of the broader picture, I'm gonna pass it to Eliza to talk a little bit. Um, you wanna build on this and then we can go on next. All right, so continuing with um, exploring optimal sized schools, and I said, I told you I couldn't do this part. There we go. Um, if we just think about what this could potentially look like for us, we've got all of our, um, our K through five on the left, and then you can see our current class ranges. So on a slide previously, Chase had showed you where we were in number of section ranges from 20 to six. This shows you currently in our buildings um, right in this column here, where our class size ranges are. So you can see that in kindergarten, we're ranging anywhere from a building having 14 students in a class to 24, or third grade, um, and fifth grade, those are great examples. We've got 19 to 32, or in fourth grade, we've got a section in our district that has 16 students and another section in our district that has 31 students. So that just shows the range in our district of where our current class sizes are. If we were to look at those 18 section schools, we're estimating a class range at the lower levels to be like 19 to 24, up to 22 to 30 in the older grades. So if we were to look at creating buildings that have 18 sections, this would allow for us to be able to re-envision our class sizes. Right now, I think we're all pretty familiar with the RAM, and that is something that we have continued to discuss as a priority for us as a district. However, if we were to have more right-sized buildings, we could get our ranges to be a lot smaller. This example here on the right doesn't include RAM. So we would then go back and we would, if that's something we wanted to commit to, we could go back and then RAM that. But if it's not, you can still see that that range is coming within six students instead of the 10, 11 that we have currently. One thing to add to the middle comment, sorry, Eliza, that is actually looking at all of our current 17, 18, and 19 section buildings, so the ones that are already there. Um, so those are real numbers as well. So I just want you to know that's not <clears throat> what we'd anticipate or what we believe. That's looking at our elementary schools that fall within those ranges right now. Okay, right, so as we explore the next idea, these are paired schools, and it's something that we have talked about in the district uh, several years ago. It has kind of resurfaced recently. I think it was maybe called at that time a sister school mm -hmm. idea. Um, but with a paired school, we just wanted to, to actually illustrate this with real information and real data. So on the left-hand side, you will see actual information for Mann and Lincoln. You can see their K-5 um, students, the number of sections, and their average class size for both buildings. They're both averaging class sizes around um, between 18 and 19. And we have a total, sorry, does it show everything on here? Um, sections there. So we have 21 sections between those two buildings. If we were, were to look at the paired school option with a K2 in one building, the 3 5 with these same students, we would be looking at nine sections in K2, nine sections in 3-5, nine and nine, again, make 18, so back to that idea of that, that whole entire 18 section, with class sizes around 22, 21, 22, um, but we now have 18 teachers instead of 21 teachers, which would then allow for those three other teachers to be deployed out within our system um, in those classes that are sitting at 33. Um, and so this is just a way for us to look at where we may have some um, inefficiencies by having two separate buildings with both running K-5. If we are to consolidate into two centers, the advantages that Chase had talked about with the 18 sections still really rings true in this. If you're looking over at Lincoln in their fifth grade, they've got one section, third grade, one section. 
I don't know if you've ever have a, had a child or been a child in one section, if you just don't get along with a peer really well, you are with them for six years and hope it goes well next year. Um, teachers really struggle, they don't have anybody to collaborate with grade-wise. They do a great job of collaborating across grade levels, but it really makes it hard for them to, to collaborate and to think about instruction, um, you know, content specific. So looking at paired schools would allow for us to have three sections of each of those grade levels, the opportunity for collaborate, opportunity for kids to socialize and to meet more peers, and again, be um, optimizing with 18 teachers instead of the 21 that we currently would have um, in our model. Well, and you guys know where the complaints come, right, that we see from parents. It's the 32, it's the 30, it's not the average we like to talk about about 18.7 or 18.9 right it's that outlier section that either we don't have the staffing to give or it's not the right time of the year to bring on a new staff member but it really gets rid of those high numbers so if you're just looking at the averages you can tell right yeah the average increases a little bit but you get rid of you don't see any sections of 30 sitting there you don't see any sections of 32 sitting there um, you lose your 15 your 14 and a half you know um, as an average but you also get rid of that really large number. And that's what also makes it really challenging, right? Like when we sit down and do staffing, when it's after registration day, it's like sitting August 3rd, and you look at a grade, for example, this fourth grade um, Lincoln, or this third grade, it was sitting at 32, and we did things, and we had everything at two sections, it pops over by three, and it's like, well, we can't have one section of you know, 36 students. It's like, where are we going to get that teacher from. We don't have that built into our budget, and so this would allow for us, as you can see, there are three FTE that's available for us to be able to do something different with um, if we want to compare to logo. So as Chase explained, um, the idea behind academy schools, this is something that we've looked at and explored a little bit as a district over the at least the 18 years that I've been here. I know that it's been brought up a few times, um, but if we were to look at academy schools, um, it would help us, again, get to that 18 as well, because we would be able to kind of control the size of this building um, and then thinking about um, just extended opportunities and really drawing in um, students from other districts. And so the premise of an academy of schools, it's still a public school that offers instruction and programs that are not available just in our traditional public school setting. It's designed to attract a more diverse student body throughout our district and students enroll through an application process that's based off of that program interest. So some of the examples um, that we see more widely around the country are schools for performing arts, uh, world language or language immersion school. Sometimes they may be um, a specific language academy, like a Spanish academy um, or a French academy, or um, we see leadership academies. I know that you're familiar with David Brandon, who's our principal at Penn. He used to be the principal of a leadership academy up in Cedar Rapids, where they really work on um, fostering the inner leader within students. And then the one that's probably the most popular or most widely known would be STEM, are schools that focus on science, tech, engineering, and math. And so if we were to explore academy schools in more detail, we feel that the advantages would be a specialized curriculum with focused programs. Students that really had that interest would be able to go and to be able to explore those in a much um, richer capacity than they are able. If you're familiar with the elementary right now, we don't have a lot of if any, world language experience for students uh, within our school day. That this, if that's the way that we went, students that were, had that particular interest would be able to enroll there. There would be diverse learning environments, be pulling from students across all across our district. Students and families would feel that they had the choice to enroll in that. Um, the teaching methods would be a little bit more innovative, and again, we'd be able to be more consistent with class sizes and really maximize our building capacity. On one of those beginning slides um, that we had, that Chase had presented here, you would see that, I think Alexander was right at the top, what their current enrollment and their capacity were was exactly 200 student difference. And so we know that there is capacity in our buildings that we're unable to fill just with our regular boundary lines, that with academies we would be able to think about that enrollment a little bit. And then the final um, exploration that we wanted to bring to you tonight was preschools. 
Um, we all know that we have done a tremendous amount of work and are super proud of what we're able to be standing up this fall around preschools with having um, at least one preschool in every, every one of our elementary buildings and in several of them, I think six, we will have full day programs, whether it's the full day that we're standing up or the ones that we're doing through shared visions. But if we were to have um, space available at all buildings because we were to choose um, one of these other options or think about some of the other things that we could do, then we would possibly be able to explore preschool centers. Um, preschool center would be um, a school that is dedicated entirely to early childhood, so there would be classrooms of what we would anticipate, three and four year old students that could potentially extend beyond that school day hours of offering some kind of before or after school care, because we know that a lot of our families that are currently have three and four year olds need care beyond just that eight o'clock to three o'clock time period. Um, they would Traditionally, they're centrally located around the district. So if we were to think about something here in Iowa City, there could be a possibility of something in the Iowa City area, the Coralville area, the North Liberty area. Um, so we, there could potentially be three sites. That might not be something we're able to do right away, but that would be an end goal for us. Um, transitioning to 18 section schools would allow for elementary buildings to be potentially be purposed as the centralized preschool center. And then they'd have the, the capacity to accommodate more four-year-olds and then three-year-olds as well. Right now we do serve some three-year-olds in our half-day preschool program for tuition based off of just the, the available seats that we have come October. And so for three-year-olds, it is kind of a wait and see um, for them if there is space. It's not something that we've ever been able to, uh, at the, from the get-go, to be able to commit to families. And so this would be something that we would be allowed that we would be allowing families to commit to at three years old. And we also know that once our students get in our doors and experience the rich education that we're able to provide, the chances of them staying with us through 12th grade will increase. I'd add to that, at the same time, we know there are other programs around the area that do take three-year-olds in, and then they can stay there until 12th grade. Uh, my family was lucky enough to get a spot in one of the programs after our daughter turned three and a spot opened up in October. Um, but you know, other families will make that commitment and they won't make that transition. And in an in age of ESAs and the competition, being able to capture students into our system earlier sets us up for long-term success with those families as well. Great, so that leads us to any questions that you may have about um, the options that we presented or any kind of discussion that you want to have. Right. Before the questions, I need to correct. I misspoke a smidge on that. All of our art teachers are traveling. I'm sorry, that's yeah, yes. It's all yes, of our I'm art sorry. teachers are traveling. Yes. The buildings that have around 18 sections, some of the PE and music teachers would be fine. So of our 51 specialist teachers, 10, only 10 will not travel. And we have about three FTE dedicated to time in cars. <laughs> so that I think that's still pretty telling me that of the conversation. So just wanted to correct myself and get it accurate there. As I agreed too quickly. Did Rathena hit you? Was she no, no. <laughs> she knew I was working on it over here, so but she's gotta know that all the art teachers are yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might know that. You might have some suspicion about that. And sometimes more than two places yeah. maybe. Three. To be exact. Maybe may or may not have happened. <laughs> So I think just two kind of quick things before um, you guys uh, entertain some uh, conversation yourselves or ask us some questions that we'll do our best to respond to tonight or come back with. But obviously anything we ever do in the district, we want to make sure it's good for kids, right? We're always starting with the student <coughs> experience and how we're going to improve the student experience. And so hopefully you heard some of those things come through loud and clear about what we could do to uh, when we improve our staff experience or their ability to be more effective in their roles. We know how that improves. Uh, the student experience. Um, obviously, new programming for kids is always exciting. More preschool opportunities. We've looked at the data surrounding that before. So these are all things about that they're good for kids first and good for our students. Um, but we also can't ignore right the reality for us as we've you know went through the last two budget planning cycles about we do have you know financial uh, responsibilities and priorities that continue to pressure us too. And so we feel like our job is to bring you what are the things that we can continue to do that are going to be good for kids. 
while also adhering to these new financial constraints that we have and that we will continue to have as we move through those years forward. And then finally, I would say that it would be hard to do any of these things in isolation, right? Or to be really effective uh, with serving both of those purposes by just looking at a piece of this, that we really feel like a lot of these things work in concert. And I think you start to see some of those comparisons drawn on the preschool one, where if you look at, if you want to do more 18 section schools, then that's going to, you know, take some probably joint work with the preschool effort. Or if you want to do, you know, something around the academy schools, um, that's also going to have an impact to other campuses, right? And so how does that then uh, bleed into uh, that work, again, being tied to each other? So with that, you know, kind of setting the purpose or reminding of the purpose about why we're talking about these things, um, wanted to share that with you before you open it up for your own conversation. Uh, uh, I want to thank you, all of you, for bringing this to us, at least from my viewpoint, uh, even though I don't understand it very well right now, and may not over the next six years or so. Um, but a couple of things that struck me. One, the 18 section data, as I, as I read it anyway, seems to decrease the cut sections with, the, with the, a maximum number of students of less than 30. Brings the, sec brings the section size down. But it also increases the section size for the lower numbers of students in question. Is that a, a reasonable thing to say at this point? Yeah, that's, yes. that's how it would average out. Again, what we showed though wasn't, we didn't apply the RAM to that. So if right. we were to go back and apply the RAM, we would be able to change some of those ranges. But yes, it will bring that. Okay. To the, for the average, it'll bring that top down, but it will raise that bottom a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So part of that conversation, too, that ties in, you think about an elementary teacher, if they had a classroom of in the low 20s or mid 20s, they would be pretty happy with that. And if they consistently knew that that's approximately where my class size would be, and there may be some subtle differences, I think that you'd find that to be a much better experience for the teacher than, oh, I had 18 this year, now I have 32. That really looks different for a classroom teacher. So that was one of the things we were trying to draw in as well. Does that comport with what you're thinking, Brady? Yeah, okay. it is. Okay. I think it's also a different student experience. Very much if so. If you go from a classroom one year of 16 students to the next year of 28, that, that can be hard for uh, young students to not be able to comprehend and understand yeah. why did I have all this teacher attention this year and this year I don't, and then, and then back and forth. And, Providing that consistency is as important for our students as it is for our for our staff members as well. We run into that a lot between second and third grade, because right now how our class numbers with the RAM and our aspirational goals are, they're around 26, 24 to 26 in second grade, and then they bump up 30, 32 in third grade. Well, if you were in a section that had 29 or 30, 30 kids, you would have been in a section of 15, but the next year you're gonna go to 30 and that can be a huge adjustment it is it can't it's not it can't be it is a huge adjustment for students to be k12 in a section of 15 16 students to then and having two sections so all of a sudden on one section i have every single student in third grade in this one classroom of 30 or 31 years do we have any data or national nationwide maybe or the district that indicates that this section of uh, uh, smoothing out has an effect upon academic performance. There's data on classroom yeah. size. Yeah, class size. I think it'd be hard to get. I don't know. I'm There's probably messing up my term, but longitudinal data. You know, on because that student, you know, is going to experience different class sizes throughout, and so just a. I don't know how you would do an apples to apples comparison from, you know, looking at a student that had a cl the class size of 14, then we go to a 30, and then they go back to a 14. Charlie, I'm not sure how you, how we would track that or what we'd have, but like <coughs> Director Lingo was saying, I mean, class size, you know, data has a lot of research surrounding it, but you have to do significant class size reduction, right? We've talked about that before with the RAM. Our problem here is we have cl average class sizes even below our aspirational goals, right? So these 14s and um, 15s that you're seeing, 16s are nice, but it's really below our threshold or our goal of where we're trying to get, and we can't do anything to adjust those. So then actually when they're even in our aspirational size, it feels large to them, right, because they're on the extreme end of that. With those classes that we turn into, I know you've spoke on this before, where some days 
starting the school day year, you get class that switches from this right over that aspirational goal, and then you end up in classes of four, 14 and 15. Where does that FTE come from, or traditionally in the past? Because I've heard rumors before that some of it gets taken out of secondary level FTEs, and I've heard, I'm, and I'm just wondering if that's a rumor that I have heard. You were made. I'm happy to, I mean, yeah. it, it, in some years, it's just, it ends up being an addition. Yeah. I mean, it just becomes an addition. Um, other years, like this coming year, we've been very conservative with our staffing, so we have some additional, a couple of additional FTE that we're kind of sitting on, I would say, that we have available, anticipating that that may be the case. So, you know, we've budgeted for X amount at the elementary level, so then we say, okay, we've got three that we're not assigning this spring. We know we have a few hot spots and we're going to keep an eye out for those. That's traditionally how we've tried to do it in the last few years, um, so that way it doesn't become that hit. But there are times where all of a sudden you just get in, we might have thought, okay, here's our spots that it could happen, and all of a sudden here comes seven more kindergartners in a particular building, and it's like, well, we can't have 30, so here we go. And it, and it just becomes an additional cost that we have to then explore. And if secondary to elementary yeah, that's uh, example isn't probably as um, yeah. frequent as we end up taking an elementary yeah. teacher from another school right. yep. and then placing them in a different school, and that's really, you know, that's a culture killer for us, right, yeah, when we do that. So. You do that if, if we do have to add a position on the fly, is that something we'd use unspent balance for? I mean, just to kind of go back to why we want to have this cushion of money in the past, but I think that's what we work to do now is to know, okay, we've got to create some cushion for us to say, hey, if we're going to have some change in FTE, that's why these guys have now held back some of that FTE to then position accordingly where we get fluctuations in size. But yes, Lisa, if we didn't have it budgeted for, then yeah, we're pulling from the general fund if we're adding staff. Otherwise, we're we're taking a staff member from another school and repositioning them, re you know, reassigning them basically. And then that's hard on school communities, right? You guys have all seen us have to do that at different times of the year too. COVID was a pretty frequent example of that because of the movement of kids, where we were just having to do more of that as they would transition programs too. No one wants me to call them. No, no. no. Mid no August. It's so Mid August. <laughs> they never want to get the message from me saying. They don't want to be. So. So there's that show. But then it's that it's that that family that thought they were going to be in these two sections of 17, you know, or two sections of 16. And then they lost one student, all of a sudden, well, it's ice cream social, you met your two, but sorry, now you're down to one with 31 because we went over here. And to bring it full circle, if we're sitting around 18 section buildings, we wouldn't see as much of that fluctuation. And so we would be able to be a little bit more prepared for that, of knowing that every building's gonna need about 18. Some, some years it might be 17, but if it was down one or two kids, Right now we have to make the move because there's somebody else that's sitting over here that needs another section. Whereas if we were a little bit more consistent, we wouldn't need to do that that year and we'd be able to, to be creative of what we what we have. So if we're going to going to an eighteen section paradigm or policy, would that change make any difference would that have any effect on where kids are going, which building they're going to? Yeah, it'd be a different way to design it, right? I mean, we talked to you about a couple solutions about how you could get there through, you could try to engineer that through the academy schools, through choice. You could try to do that through reconsidering some elementary sites as preschool centers and redistributing students. Or you could look at your boundaries, right? I mean, and kind of take a new lens on how you would look at boundaries to design those 18 section schools based on the amount of students. So that isn't one we wouldn't necessarily put on there, but um, you would have to do something you know, as the data at the beginning shows where we're currently positioned to get to that 18 section concept, because there's only a, you know, a number of uh, schools that sit in that experiment now, or in that, that situation now. Because if you look at the, the Man Lincoln example that we shared, that's pretty clean, right? That's our cleanest Charlie, one. Right? Yeah. Like, and so um, we combine it, but you wouldn't have to really make any, any shifts. There you wouldn't have to, yeah. Um, they're just not all gonna be that clean necessarily. With these three grade, three grade, has there been any discussion of uh, keeping the administrator between two buildings and finding cost savings there? With you mean yeah. like one I administrator? Mean, for the continuity of care. If my child starts at Man and goes on to Lincoln, so that they're not hopping between administrators between after three years. I mean, a lot of this just comes down to finance and finding other money. Where 
Yes, yeah, I'm not sure the question that asked. I was part of the Lincoln community when they had to share a principal with man, yeah. and it actually does not work out yeah. very well. It, it, it was a it was a terrible. It was it was an I won't say that. It was a tough year because you really need a person in the building, and and they're going <coughs> out and, and and it seems good on paper, but it didn't work out that year. We do think there's some other operational efficiencies that can come by doing this, so there would be some savings as we look at that, but that wasn't one that What would be some of those savings? Well, I think it's, again, we're going to reduce travel. And, I mean, you, you can now create, because there's an 18 section between those two, two schools, so you are looking at some things with specials that can be more, like, if you're just, you treat that like it's one building then for that case. Mm -hmm. So similar to what you're saying with the principal, what you're now doing that with the specials teacher or wherever it might be. So that's going to create some more. It could be like title teachers and yep. ELL teachers if we're able to think of it that way and then we would potentially only have one place that they need to travel back and forth and we would obviously be thinking about proximity for that as well. Um, and so it would be able to just get a little bit more efficient with our, our staffing numbers. And we keep saying travel, but to put it in perspective, it's over three FT this year. So mm -hmm. over $300,000 in just teachers driving around mm -hmm. to elementary school. And then we give a mile. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's, so it's, 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 it's three. We talk about class size. Mm -hmm. in, uh, that's yeah. three individual. That's the equivalent of three individuals that could be leading the classrooms that, that we have to give up to, to drive around. I guess with all with all these options, <coughs> transportation is probably not going to be somehow there be something. I mean, I can't even put it together in my head, but. Paired schools, or even you know, the transportation needs would change somehow. In this particular example, it's actually not a huge. It's not really a change whatsoever, just because we're talking about smaller populations and close proximity of the schools. Yeah. So you could actually, we actually looked at it and thought we could do this with the same number of routes that are currently yeah. existing, because it's just the close. It just be right. I drop off at one place and I drop off at the other. Because you could have a circumstance where we use Lisa. You know, maybe our kids would one of them's at demand. K2 center and one's at the 3-5, well, the K2 kid gets hop, dropped off and then we drop them off at the 3-5. Oh, sure, so they're on the bus together. So, so, the so, so that, in this example, yeah. now some of the others that we would look at, it could change. Like, yeah, we had a conversation about boundaries or different things, obviously. That and if you look at the academies, right? Yeah, academy yeah, increases will there be transportation considerations? Yeah. Because they're all unknown. If we're looking at the academy, I'm assuming part of that exploration would be um, additional conversations with our staff and our families to get a sense of which one would have the most interest mm -hmm. to ensure that we offer that choice. Yeah, the program, I think we'd have some certain campuses we'd probably recommend to you just from a capacity standpoint that would make sense, you know, to be a draw for whatever programming. I know you're talking more about the programming, President Malone, that, okay, how would we pick that programming piece? but. But I do think you'd want to look at certain campuses that have room for additional students or that would be able to kind of find the synergy of the 18 section school concept that would, would help us on a staffing end. With the academies, isn't there a lot of just taking a computer to pay Paul when it comes to shuffling students around the district? So if we're having students shuffle into one elementary school and they're decreasing enrollment of the surrounding elementary schools, does that leave us in kind of the same problem in a way? Not if you control the parameters, right? And so you would control the applications, the, the ability for who gets in, who doesn't get in. I mean, the, the district would want to set the rules accordingly to that, right? I mean, in, in some of those situations. So if you were doing it not only for, you know, providing this, this um, different type of programming to kids, but also for some kind of operational efficiency standpoint, you would want to make sure you set rules that didn't, position another campus then that becomes you know a really inefficient campus and so you would have to think about that about okay well maybe we couldn't take 20 kids from this one school right I mean how would we establish some rules to protect ourselves against that I also wonder if we would get a draw from open enrollment that's what I was going to say yeah. so yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's adding on it, it, it'd have to be in a location that's mm -hmm. conducive for people dropping off kids though. I don't get I don't think so I mean I'm just saying because I know people that uh, chooses to drive into West Liberty mm -hmm. for their Spanish emergent yeah, courses. It's the closest and, point. Right, yeah. and it's not 
not close to where they're driving from, but that's the sort of life that they want their child to have because they start that at kindergarten. And at the same time, we know a lot of people from West Liberty, West Branch, come into Iowa City to work at the Hosta Hospital or, or other places in town. So and that's an that's an offshoot of this conversation as we look at that. But I think that people are don't actually have a good sense of the rules about transportation mm -hmm. with open enrollment and. Um, you know, there are ways that we can provide transportation to students that open enroll um, at, a, at, at a free cost to, to everybody. And, and so, again, an academy is different because we'd have to decide what the transportation rule was for that. But, um, you know, there are some things we look at advertising and how we attract students into the district that we can address on some of the other pieces, too. When are we supposed, to, what's the timeline of the next demographers report? Uh, we will begin working on that with the demographer firm in the fall. So we do that in every other year cycle. Yeah. And we always begin in the fall so that the report is completed after we've completed our certified enrollment on the October 1st count date. So typically we get most of the report put together prior to that. And then once we get that certified enrollment data, that goes to them, they complete the report and deliver it. Um, thank you for the presentation and the, and the slide deck. I actually thought it was really well put together. Tons of data and information in there, so everyone who worked on it. Kristen gets the uh, credit for making it digestible. <laughs> um, what, what strikes me, I couldn't find Adam's heat map that he always does of the um, red to green. Oh. Like, um, but. I know, you know, we're orange-ish red in operational efficiency, which is why we're having this conversation. And looking at slide five off the top of my head, man, I think Waukee is that deep, deep green, right? And I think Ankeny is that deep, deep green. <coughs> and, and looking at this uh, slide five, it's, it's wide, right? They're, they're so wildly efficient with their elementary schools. Um, and I think in where we are with budget and funding, that we have to me we have to be, get out of that red and get to the green also because every dollar that we can save in operational efficiency is money that we can redirect into well if we don't have to save it uh, into student programming and so I think that this slate of options is is good because it's I, I think it's going to be transformational in getting us to the green but much like how we made our middle school decision I think these choices are all really good for our kids too. So like we're gonna save money, but you've, you've done a great job of articulating what our benefits are to our students. Like why does it make sense to have 18 sections and, and the class size consistency, and that's great for our staff also. You know, what are the benefits of having a preschool center? Oh, we can extend the hours, we can serve three-year-olds. So to me, this suite of options um, is something we have to do because of our budget situation, but it's also something that we get to do um, because it's going to make things better for our, our students. So I, I mean, I my questions are like, what do you need for like, how fast can we start implementing this? Like, what do you need? What are the next steps? Because I mean, yeah, and and I'd also I'd also add with the I think the academy is the um, is the most open one that has kind of the most paths so we can, it, it's the hardest to materialize quickly, but I sat on that Portrait of a Graduate um, study group, and I think all of those parents in, in Portrait of a Graduate were like, we called them magnets back then, so they didn't say academies, but, but they were really excited about that. That's something that came out from that study, which was a huge undertaking, um, and that's what I think our, our community really is interested in and what they want to see, so even that, it's harder to think about what it looks like, but I, I think that's something that we're really, that, that our community is excited for and, and supportive of. And one thing I would say, just the experience in the district that had magnet schools at the elementary, families always want to know what's next. Yeah. They really enjoy the experience in elementary. They hope there's something that's going to propel that. So what's next, Lucas? Uh, this is 
this is not an or kind of situation, it's an and, right? Correct. It's figuring out yeah. how many of these things make sense where. So the kind of questions I would want some answers to, not tonight, but how many different places are there that we need to address to try and right size some schools? And do all of the schools, can they handle like an 18 class? Because we've got some small yeah. physical spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I, I just don't have it in my head whether they can handle that number or not. So just kind of getting an idea of where we need to address things. We have a very great example of the paired school, but what other spots are in real need of looking at to try and get the right size? Because we do have a fair number that are. Yep. Um, so it's not changing everything, but I, I don't have a good sense of how much has to get looked at. Or but it's definitely an and of all of these things on the table not just picking a thing that we're going to do. Just as a point of reference, probably, and we well, probably should have included it somewhere, an 18 section building ends up being about 400 and low 400, right? So as you think about, as you look at the capacity slide or some of those others, you can kind of get a sense of where that kind of falls out a little bit, and I'll give you a little information. Bottom room right around that 425 to 400, depending on how sections currently, Graham influences that as well. So some of our you know, North Liberty schools are higher than that 425, and then some of our other schools are closer to that, you know, 400 range. Okay. We've got time for one more comment. So maybe our follow-up can be that we share some more specific examples of how you could put this puzzle together, right? And just for feedback and response to, right? Not a recommendation, but just to say, here's, here's two or three different options of how you could look at piecing these things together. Obviously, you have a really good example, like you guys have stated with Lincoln and Mann, but you know, what, is, what would be a preschool center? What would you do with the kids that were at that school and where would they get redistributed to? What would an academy school look like? Which campuses would we target you know, specifically for something like that? We could bring back a few of those options to the next kind of work session on this topic and give you a chance to respond to those. And the one last additional talking point I'd add that, I know, I'm sorry, uh, beyond the efficiencies and it being good for kids is also we know, uh, we know the flavor from the governor from the state this year was about parent choice. Mm -hmm. And providing a variety of school settings, an envelope of school opportunities, we say, that provides parents choice. We talk a lot about us being a destination district and now we're going to be a destination district where you can actually choose the pathway that your student can, can go into. And I think that becomes a huge selling point for us as well um, as we try to navigate those pieces too. And so um, that's all. President Malone, I will. Uh, I've got the queue. <laughs> <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.